Okay, how did you get involved in the film Simone? How did I get involved in the film Simone? Let's see. I have, or I still have, I hope, this friend named Betty Kaplan who uh, had threatened to work with me before and uh, we never somehow were able to, you know, get that opportunity in the past. But uh, then she approached me with a cameo role in this little movie that she was doing in kind of art house erotic indie. And I took a look at it and be honest, I kind of found it a little tough. I I wasn't sure where my character, or the one that she was offering me at the time, like was coming from. And I, it's one of those things we actors do sometimes when we have when we find a block in 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 the material that we're given that we're not exactly sure if we should approach it this way, that way, or the other. And every other character's lines seem much easier, you know. So I'm like. Oh man, I uh, you know, the, the the lead character. I just felt um, I felt it fit me a little better, and I thought, wow. And I asked her, I said, did did you cast the lead role? She goes, yes. Well, we have someone in mind that uh, you know that was you know ready to do the part, and I said, okay, no worries. But uh, you know, if that changes, or if if you uh, if you think, I mean, I wouldn't mind. Giving it a shot, I, I think I could, I could wrap my head around this guy, you know, based on the rest of the script, which was, um, like I said to some people before, you know, it, it brought tears to my eyes, and um, that's usually a good sign for me, you know, when something can move you, and you don't even know why exactly. There's something unspoken, although there's a lot of sp spoken in this movie. It's a novel, so you're inside the head, but there's something about the layering of these events like that. You know, things happen that hit you unexpectedly. And that, to me, you know, is a really good sign because um, I like things that don't tell me how to feel, but eventually layer reality so much in such a way that before you know it, you're caught up in it and before you know it, your heart gets ripped out. So when I read this script, I thought, wow, would they consider me for the role? You know, I, uh, I wouldn't mind giving a shot at it. So I guess that's how I got involved. I guess she took me up on that offer. How does it feel to shoot? I know you've shot Death in Granada hmm. a long time ago. That also had a lot of foreign people. How does it feel to be in your land, <clears throat> shooting with all Puerto Rican team? You know, it's really interesting to work here in Puerto Rico because while any outsider may say, this is your land, this is Puerto Rico, you're Puerto Rican. I wasn't born here. And that's a big distinction amongst some folks. I might as well be a gringo to uh, some of the folks that feel like only those who are born here and live here and experience life here can really be called Puerto Ricanos, you know, Boricuas. But uh, I take a little issue with that because no matter where we are as Latinos in the United States, we're still other. We're, we're still not exactly embraced as uh, well as certain other nationalities like the Germans, the Irish, and the Italians eventually were, after they were uh, kind of ostracized. <clears throat> um, being Latino is something that, you know, you can't necessarily blend in or out of the mainstream. So I've always felt like I wasn't American enough to Americans, yet not Puerto Rican enough to Puerto Ricans. So working here is a really interesting dichotomy or, 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 or conundrum because my blood was born here. My parents are from here. And if you think about it, what is here? They came from Europe and Africa and, and uh, native stock. So I think Puerto Rican is a state of mind combination of, you know, having lived here and having come from people who lived here. And it, we're a peculiar bunch. We're not your average Latinos, 
uh, I don't think, you know, we're not your average Americans, but we, we embody all of that in a, in a really interesting mishmash of, you know, Anglo and Latin cultural influences that is, is quite maddening to some people and entertaining to others. So I love working here. Um, there's something that happened, you know, when I worked here in Death in Granada or the disappearance of Garcia Lorca. And I realized I loved rapping. At the end of the day, I, di I didn't feel as exhausted as I felt in other places. I, especially if we rapped before the sun went down and I could go to the beach. We'd have a beer. And I'm like, oh my God, you're working in paradise. In one, at one hand, you can go into a, you know, urban blight area and shoot something stressful, or you can shoot 500 years in 500 year old buildings in old San Juan. Or you can go to the jungle and uh, the only tropical rainforest, the United States, you know, territory has a tropical rainforest is in Puerto Rico, El Yunque. And you can go there and imagine what it was like before colonization. So there's a lot of different um, uh, terrains and, and, and locations with which to, to shoot in. And I, I find them all fascinating and it can be a challenge. We are a noisy people. We are, a, you know, a condensed bunch, so trying to get everyone to be quiet is a challenge. But, um, but there's an energy here. The crews are very, very, oh, how should I say, they're dedicated and they put their heart and soul into it. And uh, they've come a long way from when I first worked here about 20 years ago in, in my first film here. I've worked a few times in between in Smaller Fair, but this work in, in Simone is the most challenging of all the times uh, of, that I've worked here because I am literally in every scene in this movie and I was like, wait, how did I not notice that? Oh my God, this, is, this really demands a lot. And it's a big challenge because, you know, we actors, we have our, our mannerisms, we have our gestures, we have our quote unquote bag of tricks, let's just say. And if you fall upon those too much, it's easy to realize within a very short time in a movie where you're in the whole movie. So you have to be present and aware to not kind of tread over the same area too much, to not, you know, um, be predictable and kind of repetitive in, a, in an uncreative and in an unilluminating uh, manner, you know, Unilluminating of your of your character or of the story, so it's a huge challenge. And also, when you shoot out of context, uh, out of uh, sequence, remembering where you were in a scene where you run out and on a different day continue that exterior, you know that's a challenge. And um, and just to bring it all back together, working with my fellow Puerto Ricans, um, born here or not. Uh, I felt a support and a pride in them that chokes me up. Really chokes me up. As I speak. Because I think they noticed in me one of their own taking on this role and, and, and revealing their humanity, flaws and all. And they feel like I feel. We, we're an overly feeling people, you know? We have a lot of passion and sometimes that gets, you know, it's not always understood properly or accepted, but we just have so much heart. And um, I'm just very proud that mi gente, my people have surrounded me with dedication, discipline, their love, and nothing but the best of intentions to make this story come to life. Let's go in and go tighter. So I know you've answered it a bit about the acting, mm. but you normally play the heavy, the mm. bad guy and evil guy. How does it feel to play the romantic lead, if you can call the writer that? You know, it's really funny because uh, most of my life I've been the baby face, the kid, you know, younger looking than my actual years. And, you know, that got me a lot of work for many years. But as I uh, 
Uh, to become more sophisticated, or uh, what's the word, uh, seasoned. Um, you know, playing characters that I used to play more readily, romantic leads, like this one here, uh, few and far in between. I actually tell, I joke to my friends, I said, I, I, I don't know how long it's been. It's probably been more than a decade since I played a romantic lead, in, in, especially in a feature film. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's thrilling. It's, it's exciting on one level because who doesn't want to explore or plumb the depths of, of love, which I've done in real life enough and have a lot to bring to the table. But it's also terrifying because the older I get, the more sensitive I am to things like lighting. Um, the ravages of time, which, you know, people, kind, kind people like Betty and others say, no, you look great. But I know if I just were to change these lights right here, it, it'd be different. Now, maybe much more for myself, you know, but it's just different. So you end up worrying because in the past, I've said to myself, you don't look at your own product enough. You don't look at yourself as a product. You need to... You need to study yourself and you know, dispassionately, because I've seen other actors do that. I've, I've watched a few actors that I won't mention any names, who have become amazing, amazingly successful, and they study themselves, and they love watching themselves. And then there's the cliche of actors like myself, who are just, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Stop mugging! Stop making! Stop raising your eyebrows! Stop creating the like! Stop! Stop doing the bad habits that the big stars have somehow grown out of. So for me, it's a balance between living truthfully in the moment and not betraying what it is that people kind of want to spend a couple of hours or whatever amount of time looking at, not hurting yourself. You know, whether it's my hair in La Bamba, which took me a while to get over and used to the first screening I saw that, I literally... I, I cried. I thought, I'm, my career's over. I, I'm done. Somehow, when I did my hair earlier in the day and got it right the way the character, you know, I thought would, wanted to look, throughout the day, they didn't have product to kind of keep your hair, anti-humectants at the time. So throughout the day, I could only describe my hair as going through a Jiffy Pop thing. <laughs> Slowly but surely became like a black cloud over my head, and I just was mortified. But... Thank goodness that other people don't see the flaws that you see in yourself, as much anyway. So there's that. And I had to get over myself and my insecurities. And as you can see, I'm still working on it. But it takes me about three viewings before I can like put away the fact that I don't look like what I had envisioned in my head. You know, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, it's different than when a camera looks at you. Believe it or not, it's just different. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you're looking at the same angle that you've seen yourself at, with the same wide lens focus or not, you know, the, the, the angle and the, the, how should I say, the same point of view and angle of view that your own eyes have constantly um, received. But when, when a camera looks at you, it looks at you through the eyes of everyone else, which do not you know, conform to what you're used to seeing. And, um, and that can be freaky because, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen myself and just face planted and going, oh my God, why didn't anyone tell me? Whether it's weight gain or, um, or just, you know, the hair being too, flat and two these things seem superficial they seem you know kind of like lightweight but you know I'm my only product I have and if I'm not conscious of it I think you know I, I can betray that which um, which has gotten me some blessings which is uh, you know some people think I'm good-looking awkward to acknowledge and say, but okay, thank you very much. It's not the end-all be-all, 
but if without that, then the talent sometimes doesn't always get a chance to shine through. So it's a, it's an interesting magnet or double-edged sword. How do you feel about the material that you've shot so far? Well, what we shot so far, I can't fully gauge yet because I haven't really seen it. I haven't seen it in dailies or cut together, but it's been very strange if I maybe brutally frank you know there are times where you're on set mosquitoes are biting you you're sweating through your makeup you're worrying that your hair and clothes may not exactly match and you have a million little concerns and and trying to get your dialogue right and I'm and I'm thinking to myself what am I doing here what have I agreed to what am I doing here you know and yet from early on, I have this sneaking suspicion, if all goes well, that something's being created that has, that's taking on a life of its own. I know it might sound like a cliche, but, you know, when I was asked what songs made me cry, I was challenged, but I thought of three, and uh, Betty and her wisdom followed up on those, and had playback of those songs and you know sometimes you can wear out a trigger you can wear out an emotional trigger because as actors we tend to um, look for things that can trigger us and if if you repeat it again and again it kind of loses its freshness you know like a, like the first take is always exciting because literally it's that very first time but then after a dozen or two it, it gets easy to get um, wrote and it loses its freshness so in this case it was quite extraordinary not one time did those triggers not work if everyone was quiet and I had you know at least 10 or 30 seconds to just put the world out and go back into that private place that rips my heart to pieces sure enough those um, those songs and those triggers reached something deep inside of me that I hope was captured. And if it was, it was real pain. It was real gut-wrenching, which I am experiencing now just talking about it. That's what we call sense memory as actors. We need to be that close to our emotions in order to call upon them reliably and um, it's powerful and I think with the wonderful set locations the wonderful cinematography you know the the images Betty has captured and, and, and contorted or created with her direction I think this could be a very, very deeply moving and profound experience for the viewer. How was it to work with Conjuli? Ah, uh, don't get me started with Conjuli. Kunjue, Kunjue Li, who I can't say enough to and about. Um, I've already expressed this to her and to Betty and to anyone who cared that I, I think her presence and her talent has uh, saved this experience from, for me from becoming like some other experiences that tried but, you know, were very trying instead with other performers who are so self-involved and so insecure that they have to pull diva or devo, you know, activity and, and, and it's not about the work, it's not about fellow artists trusting each other and creating the unexpected. It becomes ego driven and very stressful. I have to say Kunjue has been such a breath of fresh air. Amazingly <laughs> youthful and childlike 
without being childish. And that's very important. She, um, she has made my job infinitely easier because it's just easy to love someone like her who is not presumptuous, who does not resent my often nervous attempts to make a suggestion without, you know, stepping out of line and, you know, imposing my opinion or, or views on a fellow artist. She appreciates my experience and wisdom, if I may call it that, um, and has just, you know, my love for her as an artist mirrors my love for her as a character. So, so yeah, to answer your question, Kunjali's pretty cool. <laughs> She's an old soul and a bright-eyed spirit Really at the same time. Lee Chow. She embodies Li Chao in many ways. In many ways. And um, and she's not Li Chao, you know, which is interesting. She's not a lesbian working, you know, an invisible person, but she knew how to identify with that. I think in all of us, I think all of us at one point or another, no matter how famous you can be, feel invisible in certain circumstances. And that's what brings our characters together in a way. We share our mutual vibration on that level, you know. We, we, we bond and, um, and I'm just honored and privileged to work with such a, a cool, cool actor. So what did you feel on Monday, our 13th day of shoot? When they Monday the 13th? <laughs> oh, I was devastated when they told us we couldn't keep shooting. Because, you know, the funny thing was that we were the only productions in town. It was, I think, ours and one other. And uh, back in L.A., in Hollywood, and maybe even Mumbai or Bollywood, everything is shut down. And there we were, the little film that could when nobody else could, you know? And I was like, yes, what a great thing. Like, I could be home or I could have been on this other job that uh, <clears throat> I was uh, not shooting. But I thought, hmm, interesting. This one, at this point, why? How? It's a, it was a miracle. And I thought, this was a blessing. We can make our film. And then we got the axe, and then that's when, um, and in the middle of the day too, which was a, a real, uh, I don't want to call it tragedy, but, um, you know, it was a real problem or, or a, a real, oh my God, words are losing me right now. It, it was... Uh, heartbreaking. Heartbreaking, and what's the word? I, I was crestfallen because I was working with the one and only Caterina Murinu, who is another special soul and, uh, and consummate artist and just brings so much, so much world, beauty, experience, class, dignity, grace to her work and to our labor of love. Um, she was able to do her coverage and then we were cut off from my ability to do, to react to her when my coverage of that scene was going to be done. And she literally cried. She cried because she couldn't be there for her fellow actor. I'm a wuss, obviously. Um, it breaks my heart because I know, I know how much it means to her to not be one of those actors that's so mechanical, that's so self-involved, that they'll give their best work while the camera's on them and, you know, good luck while it's on you. I gotta go. I'm not being paid enough or I'm too important or I just can't be bothered. Unfortunately, some actors are, are known to fall into that selfish habit or, you know, regrettable habit. Um, I try not to judge. Um, but uh, that I couldn't do it with her there 
really affected her. And I spoke to her recently and I said, don't worry. And I mean this, what I'm gonna tell you that I said to her, I said, your performance was so grounded that it, it, it was seared in my memory. Oh, I remember exactly what you did and how you did it. And you're there. Then you work with the Alice Mejias and Braulio Castillo. You work with some of the top. Oregon. Wonderful. Wonderful folks that, you know, that I never worked with before. So I, I had no, no context, no idea. And, you know, as much as people say, hey, you're from this island. We don't know all of each other's wonderful actors and artists. So it's, it's, a, it's a treat for me to work with um, Braulio and his his uh, presence that alone is very, very formidable uh, and his talent and, and Aris who's just uh, mercurial and always looking to, to find you know, a way in and around the scenes and it's, and it's you know, uh, obstacles because believe me, there are obstacles. Um, we're shooting a novel, and novels are not easy to interpret into film. Although you've seen the best ones out there, they're just it's not easy to take words and um, and make sure that that they're a, the right words for any given moment at any given time. Sometimes we have to self-edit on the day, and that's why we're lucky to have Betty, who's been very um, how should I say? Am I talking to Betty or am I talking about Betty? <laughs> Um, we have Betty who's been very generous with our um, suggestions and has considered uh, most of them, you know, if and when she can because, again, she's wearing a very big hat on this production. So as being the writer, it's easy for her to go, just forget it or just change that or, okay, don't worry about it. She's more concerned with the emotional truth being captured and the and the dynamics which is very encouraging to me so yeah so we have a uh, we have a situation where we we have actors that I'm just now learning about and working with who are well known here and uh, and in their home countries like Caterina and Kunjue and um, and I just hope that we we were afforded the chance to do this and that we don't let um, paranoia in the time of hysteria stop us from creating art. And I don't say that in a, oh, how should I say, in a pompous way. Um, I sometimes cringe when I see certain artists refer to themselves as artists it seems a little pretentious but I guess I can say after more than half a century on this planet I know art when when I feel it and when we're making it and this feels like art it feels like the intangible is being captured and that's always a good thing how are you dealing with the quarantine don't get me started with the quarantine. <laughs> I'm actually pretty well. I did an interview yesterday for Primer Impacto, which I don't know if it'll make the light of day. Because, uh, you know, I said to myself, don't get too deep. Don't get too conspiratorial. Don't look at these things and talk to the masses on a, on a show about uh, usually entertainment issues that don't get too profound. Um, but I couldn't help but touch upon it and just tell folks to stay positive, to look at the bright side, to get enough sun, to not get locked up in their minds as well as their apartments, to look for, to take the time to look for the beauty in their lives and in each other, not kill each other. <laughs> um, man, I, I have a funny feeling that many bar bodies will be discovered after this all blows over. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, 
confining people who may not be used to or may not want to be confined in small spaces for such a long amount of time on such a repeated basis can be not always a healthy thing. Or maybe it is, or maybe you're going to be confronting your demons or each other's. So, you know, I told people to be positive and, and look at the bright side and not to panic. And that I wasn't always, um, how should I say, I'm not one to always um, believe in talking heads or experts, especially when they've been wrong in the past before and nobody calls them out on it. And nobody really does deep diving into the ways that we are manipulated one way or another. So for me, it's been uh, really rough, even now, trying not to get too esoteric and into the weeds about what I've discovered that most people are not privy to and are actually distracted away from. That is alarming, much more so than the news that uh, we're supposed to be alarmed by. So, Betty and Peter made this, decided to make this book into a movie because it showed another side of Puerto Rico that hadn't been shown before. Do you, do you agree with that? What do you think? No, I definitely think Betty and Peter, um, I definitely, I, I definitely think one of the reasons Betty and Peter chose this film is because it shows another side of Puerto Rico, not just the sirens. Yeah, I definitely think that Betty and Peter chose to make this film because it shows another side of Puerto Rico. It shows the kind of like the shadow side. It, it, it just, I don't know, I think it explores it on emotional levels, not just uh, uh, architectural or exter external levels. It gets inside, inside the skin of the characters as well as inside the skin of the island. And, you know, it just, I mean, Puerto Rico is a character of its own. You know, it's, it's, it's like that subsonic sound that you may not hear, but you feel. And um, I hope she really uh, captures what uh, I think she can, and uh, and what Eduardo Lalo, the writer, uh, did in in a, in, a, in a literary sense. Anything else? No. <clears throat> Come on, is shoot him. Come on, you you This is a deposition, right? Are you now, or have you ever been a member of the? Independentista party? Is that what you're going to ask me? <laughs> no, I thought, well, I've got, I think we've got what we needed. But you only have one angle, one question at all, uh, compared to everything else okay, on that side. Well, I'm um, just thinking you might want to mix it up here or ask me the same questions. I'll ask you, how does it feel to play this frustrated, dysfunctional writer? Wow. How does it feel to play this dysfunctional, frustrated writer? Huh, I have no idea what that feels like. I had to do a lot of research to uh, figure out what frustration, what not being appreciated, what feeling invisible at times feels like. Believe it or not, you know, um, I took this character on kind of like, like a cloak. Did I research every book that this professor would have read or written? No. Did I look at all the work of Simone Bay or Weil or Weil? No. Did I look at enough material and documentaries about her and her work to develop a, an emotional connection to her? Yes. Did I put myself in the driver's seat of a car that I'll, although I don't know exactly what every part does in a technical way while I can't put the car together and take it apart, I know how to drive? Yes. This character for me was like a well-worn baseball glove that somebody else 
wore in, but that I then took on and felt like it was always mine. And that's what you have to do as an actor. You have to own your characters in a way that no one else can, in ways that no one can see how or why. You make it personal. And I think I've done that. Or I'm, I'll die trying. What about the voyage into love? Mm. The you want me to? Surprises. Wow. Well. Brings and the pain it brings and the joy it brings. It it really is a story of having the courage to love. Yeah, this really is a story about having the courage to love and more importantly what it is to love. Is love to possess? Is love to inhabit? Is love merely to penetrate and or be penetrated by on, in a variety of levels? Um, or is love something that just evolves and actuates on its own without you even trying? I found this, this experience to be, oddly enough, like that of playing with a boa constrictor. And before you know it, you can't breathe. It grips you and it consumes you. Anything else? How was it to work with Betty? Betty! <laughs> don't get me started with Betty. Okay, don't tell her anything, but no. Betty's a funny bird because she's someone I've known for years and someone I've admired and respected for having done what she's done, as they say, in a man's world, before it was a thing, um, before it was so in vogue, and yet never actually experienced it. So there was a degree of culture shock, in a sense, when you're finally there. It's kind of like a prearranged marriage where you're not together, you grew up in separate countries, but your parents have arranged your, your wedding, like they do in certain cultures. And then when you finally get together, you're like, oh my God, who are you? What is this? You know, I'm sure she was, uh, she found it a bit exhausting to deal with my neuroses and concerns and fears and, and suggestions and ideas and, and attempts to help that while often um, she saw the value of help, at other times, she had no time <laughs> to deal with and, uh, and was rather frustrated by as well. And I understood this and I, we spoke and, you know, to her credit, she really, she really allowed me to express myself when the time came and uh, express my concerns. And, uh, you know, not that they've all been allayed but she's gained my confidence to continue to bear my soul and often questionable suggestions, <laughs> um, you know, without worry. Um, I'm putting a lot of trust in her because, you know, A, I have no choice. I'm here and you're not gonna get me to second guess someone constantly when you've committed to the role. You're here. And if you've committed to the role, you commit to the challenges ahead. So working with Betty has been uh, enlightening and I guess we'll have to wait to the final edit to see if that trust was misplaced or not. I got a feeling that no matter what, she's going to put together something very special and, like herself, tasteful.
she's got a lot of class and good taste so Think you do. I think there's two, two. Do I lie? Well, how, how how hard is it to talk like that, frankly, about someone while they're standing right there? It's <laughs> okay. Not easy. No, but. But you never accept anything as easy, do you? I try, and if I do, I make it hard. <laughs> but um. there are two. There are two people on a film that really say they know that they. Off their clothes and yeah. show their soul naked, and that is the actor, the director, and the writer. Yeah, no, it's it's true. Um, our craft consists of relying upon the um, the intimacies and life experiences of the forming artists or performing artists. Wow, I just made a link there. Uh, you perform the writing. And to perform well, you have to, again, mine deep in your soul for something worth sharing and worth taking others on a journey with. And as an actor, you have to, again, like I said before, plumb the depths of your life experience and the sense memory of things that your character goes through or at least parallels you know if you get shot in a film you don't have to get shot in real life to um, to reflect that experience or what it could be like therefore we use parallel a lot parallel techniques that's one of the reasons why I think um, some of the music on, in this movie affected me so readily and I have to watch it right now before I, I don't want to get maudlin here and I don't want to cry at every turn but the music um, from John Lennon Mind Games was directly related to a video well not only do I love the song in and of itself for its general artistry and passion and it's raw brilliance and all the things it could be applied to as far as mind control and society and how we play mind games with each other and how our governments or media or you know just how mind games are played but my mother passed away recently for me it'll always be recent and uh, my significant other videotaped an exchange I had with her where I was trying to sing a song. An old song I remember. I don't know who the artist was exactly, but I don't know if it was Puerto Rican or not, but it was a Spanish ballad called Por Amor. And I'm trying to sing this to her because I remember it was a song that was popular when I was an infant. And my father would sing to me, or at least would sing in the background when I would visit him. And I would remember, and I knew that she knew that song, and I would sing it to her as she uh, was racked with Alzheimer's. And my voice was breaking as I'm trying to sing this song to her without crying. <laughs> Just like now. And my gal uh, recorded that. A certain segment and then she laid the music of mind games on top of that after you know after a certain amount of time and that just just killed me every time so the pain and the reason I'm bringing this all together is about parallels, the pain of my mother's passing and the love I have for her and her for me I was there too. Thank it is you. in the soul of both this film. Yeah. It helped me get to the tears because he was saying goodbye to the love of his life at that point. 
even though he didn't want to. Everything in his soul, everything in his being wanted to just open the door and say, yes, yes, you're home. But something more noble than his own desires directed him to, um, and there's my family calling. Something more noble than his own desires directed him to let her go for her own sake, which is what love is really all about, I guess. True love, unconditional love. It's not about what you retain, but about what you give to others, including their own freedom. <laughs>